can you hear okay? Um, my name is Thomas. I'll be teaching this course. Uh, so, few things about me. I've been I was an accountant for a while, uh, and then in finance. Uh, back then, uh, I guess it's a while back. Uh, iBanking was a pretty lucrative business, and so I was able to retire after about 10 years. I played around, golf, anything, but it gets boring, so I went back to school. Now I do teaching in various places. Uh, so here, uh, I guess in the last 10 years or so, you see many uh, new AI products being bought. If you, uh, there's, there's a recent article, I think either at BBC or uh, Bloomberg, where they say la uh, 10 years ago, people can buy pure bonds and get a good retirement uh, plan. So they have enough money to retire. Uh, now you need maybe at least 40 to half of your money in AI related stuff, real estate, private equity, uh, alternative investments to get the same return. So you see many of the government uh, and pension plans now being able to, to buy AI because they need to return and it's getting a lot more popular. Uh, we tend to hear the bad things about blowing up of hedge funds, etc. but those are really the exceptions. So it's like you hear a uh, plane crash, it doesn't mean planes are not safe, right? So here you, we tend to hear a lot of things about AI, but it's a pretty fun business. Uh, so it's getting, a uh, demand side is quite big. You see, um, you can buy many AI products nowadays. Even if you open a Hang Seng or HSBC Bank account, you can actually buy AI products online direct now. Uh, even five years ago, you have to go in, sign all the forms each time, but now it's getting very popular. Uh, people can buy it pretty easily. So that leads to the demand side of people in the business. Um, for here, we, uh, this is done by Kayak, so they check for those that had taken the course and got the destination. And most found it very useful. I guess the one that would be uh, more useful to us would be uh, many people come to get it because they're in the, on the verge of getting a promotion, but they're not sure. So some have, have quite a bit of experience, but they want to make sure they get a destination to get a promotion. Right, so some a lot are done th for that. A lot, but when you look at the news, there are you hear many hedge fund managers of you know, making billions of dollars bets and make millions on the way. Those are minority. <laughs> I mean, if if you're there uh, doing that now or near getting that way, you probably won't be here sitting and taking the course. But many um, are support staff or a normal manager. They think they find this interesting. Uh, for us, about maybe half of the students are uh, in, re in related business, in the AI business. So many are back office or support or risk management. And many of the valuation issues, because many are private investments. So the back office or the risk management guys will fight with the hedge fund manager because they have a valuation issue on what price should be. So some will come here to take the course so they, they know what's going on. So it helps them as well in the, in the work as well. So overall, it's very useful. If you look at all the industries globally, not too many have new products like AI. We have new products, new structures, new strategies all the time, and it's a pretty lively thing to do. So these are the two, two, uh, uh, the two levels of what you'll be tested. So for both levels, you get a pretty evenly spaced out topics. So for AI, these are the major topics you'll be doing. Um, in reality, either you select the business or they select you, depends on how it works out. But generally, uh, once you're in it, you will only focus on a few or one or two strategies within all these categories. So if you're thinking of going in, you don't know which one suits your personality or which one you like, this will give you a good overall perspective of what they actually do. You're not going to make millions with the strategy, but these are just the basics of what they do. So if you are uh, trying to get in uh, a position in a, in a firm, at least you know what they do, uh, so it will give you a, a leg up. If you are getting promoted, 
uh, let's say you're a hedge fund manager doing arbitraging, but your firm has other strategies. So it will help you know what the other guys do. So when you manage them, it helps you know what they do uh, in the process. So we have the real, uh, real asset. So those are like commodities and real estate. Uh, we have hedge funds. For us, we do most of the strategies, but we don't actually look into exactly how they do, just the overall blanket view of, of how each one will work and how to make money. And then private equity, this one covers both, both LBO and venture cap. And then we have structured products. Those are many of the derivatives. We have structured products, credit products, and so on. So all those will fall in here. In uh, both level one and two, you have professional standards. And so we take a major part from the CFA standard. So if you have done CFA before, it will be a pretty straightforward uh, part. When you look at level two, uh, let me come back. This you have two sessions when you take the exam. It's three hours each. Uh, it's a computer based. So you go to Pearson View in Shenwan, which might be the closest, and you sit there with the comp computer. Each session, 100 multiple choice. So overall, it's pretty, it's timing wise, it's not too bad. Most students come back and say they just finish. No extra time, but uh, I haven't heard any that said they cannot finish. For level two, it's a little different. So you still have two sessions. The first session, three hours, are still multiple choice, 100 of them, same as uh, level one. But in the second half, you got three hours, but now you get three essay questions to do. So when you look at multiple choice, it's zero professional, st professional standards. So in level two, you have one essay purely focusing on the professional standard part. In this case, you'll be given a story. It'll be maybe a one page or so. It'll tell you a story of some members or potential members and his daily work thing. So you have to write you know, what is wrong, uh, what can be fixed, and uh, uh, how come it's a problem. The other two essays will be on any of these remaining topics. So when you look at the, the weighting, it's pretty straightforward. It's 10% each pretty evenly. If you look at the kayak one and two curriculum, you would have these various topics. So each one will be like this. For level one, it's a very general overview of the topic. So you have, it'll cover everything within each asset category. It will be a very broad, but pretty shallow view. You learn the strategies, you know approximately what they do. And then in level two, you have an in-depth review of one or two topics in each asset class. So for example, in private equity, in level one, you will be uh, learning about basic how they work, timing, how long it takes, and how to make money, how to calculate the return. In level two, in the private equity part, then you have an in-depth calculation of the fees, etc. Okay, so, um, when you look at level two, uh, we'll look at it in a bit of the calculation. You have the private equity fees, which is a pretty in-depth calculation because the fees are pretty different than all the other investments because of the time it takes. The other would be your hedge funds. Here we have the convertible bonds, which is a major part of leave in level two. Uh, several years back, they move a lot of the more difficult things to level one. So in level two, it's actually easier than level one uh, when you are trying to study, because you know exactly which part are the hard parts to study and calculate it. So pretty much same, same topics, but more in-depth, narrow view of one or two subtopics from level one. In terms of study time, uh, when you look at our books in a bit, you might be surprised to find the kayak book is 800 pages long. Our book is the same, is the same length. So why come and get our book and pay extra for the same amount of reading? But here it's a little bit different of what we do. Um, the, the kayak book is pretty broad brushed. So it talks about everything. And one issue with the original book is, from kayak, is it's a, um, it's a combination of different chapters from different books. So when I was doing it a few years back, 
I actually have to buy 10 different books and read two chapters in each book. But over time, I think a few years back, they decided it you know, cost too much money. So now they have one book, but each chapter I are from different places. So there are some confusions as to how they do the symbols. Uh, sometimes you will have examples in the, in the chapters which relates to other things that's not covered. So uh, for our book, we try to focus on things that are more tested based on previous uh, uh, exams. And for some calculations, uh, we might see in a bit, uh, once you know how, you do, how to do it and understand how the formula works, it's actually pretty simple. But if you're just reading on your own, then it might take you uh, reading it two, three, four, five times to sink in and understand. Uh, sometimes students come back and say, I should have come to class, you know, before I failed the first time because I try to study. I try to memorize and understand the formula and how they work. But then uh, after they fail the exam, suddenly they click because now they understand what the formula does, but it's a little bit too late. So in our class here, we'll try to have a one-shot full understanding of each formula. So in the exam or at work, eventually, you know how it works so you can apply it properly. <coughs> so for level one, as mentioned, it's all multiple choice. You get 200, 100 each session. Uh, and then it's pretty heavily quantitative. Uh, they put all the heavy quant in level one, but don't worry too much, um, unless you're an art history major. Because there's a lot of stats and calculations, but those are maybe about 25% are your college level uh, stats like standard deviation, covariance, and so on. Uh, if you've done finance courses, some are on sharp ratio, trainer ratio, and so on. So it's really building on previous things you have done. But it's pretty heavily on those things. Some level two material from before has been pushed down. So level one, when you look at the pass rate in a bit, it's actually lower because a lot of the difficult things are now in level one, uh, which you will see. <coughs> in level two, so it's quantitative uh, and qualitative, but the quant now are a lot of times on the calculation. So uh, it's a computer-based exam, which means you have a keyboard in front of you. There's no, uh, there's a mouse, but there's no pen. So here, I normally use a, a computer with a pen, like the tablet, or this one. But their computer is regular computer. So you have a mouse and a keyboard and a screen and nothing else. So when you look at the calculation, imagine trying to do a calculation in an essay part. It's pretty impossible, right? Because you cannot write. If you have to type in a, a, a formula, it's very hard to do. So generally, they would have in level two, the calculation in the MC. They might have a big question broken down into one page question and then three to four to five multiple choice on that essay. It might be calculation of fees step by step. For the essay part, it's mainly descriptive. So they'd be asked various uh, advantages, disadvantages of whatever topic there is. So here, um, in a way, uh, MC is a little bit easier when you are doing calculation because if you get it wrong, <laughs> no answer fits what you calculate. You know there's something wrong with your calculation, right? But that's normally how they would fix it. Qualitative essay type in the, multi in, in the essay, uh, quantitative in the multiple choice. <coughs> These are the fees. Uh, so here for level one, uh, you have you pay the enrollment fee 400, uh, but you don't pay again in level two when you take the exam. Uh, and an exam registration is in pretty similar 111250 or so. And they get early birds, which um, I guess in this case, we still have, I should pass the early bird. So, but it's only a hundred bucks, so. These are the pass rates. So for some reason, level one didn't do very well in March. But normally, it's in the 60-ish percentage of, of the total. Uh, and then level two, it has been going up pretty steadily over time. So now it 
tops up high 60s, 70 for level 2. <coughs> for this, have you taken CFA or look into taking CFA? No? Okay. Um, kayak is very straightforward. If you talk to people taking CFA, um, CFA is pretty tricky. So in when you take the CFA, uh, you have they, they have section by section. You'll be told this section is on portfolio management, and there'll be 10 questions. Uh, for kayak, it's all mixed. Uh, for them, you actually don't know what you would get. Even they don't know what you would get. It's a uh, uh, just-in-time uh, data bank of questions. So when you log in, then they draw the questions for you. And even if you pay someone to go in with you to take the exam side by side with you and give you the answer, it will be all wrong because he will have a, another set of questions. So it's random. In a way, it's more difficult because you have to change your mindset from private equity to hedge funds to the next question. But compared to CFA, um, the question here is very straightforward. There's no trick question, very simple. CFA is tricky. If you read a question and you realize, oh, B is the answer, you know for sure it's wrong. <laughs> but here it's very straightforward. Uh, most of the time, if you have 100 multiple choice, three hours, so that's about 1.8 minutes per question, some would take 30 seconds, some would take longer. So um, in that case, it's a little bit better, more straightforward. <coughs> this probably won't apply to you. This is for someone that took it and didn't pass, and consider whether to redo again. But this I think the same would apply to you. Uh, if I guess it, it, it's a big f if first, is, is if you have what it takes. I mean, you, mu you must like the business. I mean, if you, it doesn't matter how much money you make. If you don't like the business, then just like any jobs, you'll hate it. Right? But if you like the, I guess, the flexibility, the, uh, the ability to grow, it's a great business to be in. So you have to work hard and study hard and, and all those things. But if you have it, it'll be a great business to be in. We get new products all the time. Uh, actually, blowing up is a good, is a good way because you, you don't blow up if you don't in renovate, innovate, right? So here, uh, even if you haven't tried before, uh, but you want to be in finance, uh, this will be a good thing to study for. Um, compared to CFA, this is more focused, so if you maybe not even consider AI, then maybe CFA is better. But if you look at the whole finance business, um, AI is really the place to be in. Uh, this is for us. So I mentioned earlier, we focus on the important parts and the difficult to understand parts, so it would cut down your study time by quite a bit. Uh, it's not you don't have to read the whole book, you still have to do the regular studying, but it would achieve, you can do it much more efficiently and effectively. <coughs> so this we won't go through here because we, since you haven't signed up for the exam uh, and you need the, the numbers to do it, but if you, look, if you look at what you'll be calculating, they would normally have two types of questions for calculation, not qualitative. So one will be difficult but mechanical. So these are, if you're level one, it's what's your standard deviation? Calculate the ratios for me. So it's, it's sometimes difficult uh, and tedious, but it's mechanical. If you know the formula, you'll get there somehow. Right? Just work it five times, ten times, you get there. The other is easy. A lot of times, these are like one sentence, 10 words questions with one formula, but these are theoretical. For these, uh, if you understand the concept, which we do in class here, then it'll be a breeze. You probably eyeball the answer without calculating. But if you don't know the concept well or the formula well, you have no clue what they ask. So this will be one part where we will add the most value in understanding how the formula works. Example for this would be uh, using binomial tree. We'll do this in both level one and two. Um, here there are two things that's useful. One is to value CDS. So for CDS, it's really an insurance policy for a bond defaulting, right? So for level one, you're counting the chance of someone or a firm defaulting on the bonds, the chance of it happening. In level two, we're doing convertible bonds. 
So it's a, a same, the same, the same uh, uh, theory, the same calculation, but now you're calculating the chance of a convertible bonds converting to equity. So in a way, it's probability-based, mathematical, but it's fun. Uh, so these are the, the easy but theoretical. You have to understand how the system works, how all the uh, calculation work. So this is the example of one that is tedious, uh, repetitive, but it's not hard to do. So this is on private equity fees. Uh, for private equity, it's a little bit different. Uh, if you do hedge funds, uh, the guy will tell you how much they made for you every month, every six months, because they take their fees. <laughs> so you would know right away, are they doing well or not? So if they don't do well, you take your money back and you find someone else. So there's no problem with fees. For private equity, uh, it's a little bit, it's in between marriage and hedge funds. You're locked up for seven years to 12. So you commit your money and you won't get it back for seven to 10 years, for sure. So it's, it's quite a long time. So there are many fee structures added in you won't find in other places to protect the investors and I guess the, fee, the funds as well. So compared to a regular hedge funds or uh, 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 a trading, uh, uh, of, of futures, there's many fees in here which you won't find in other places. And how the fees are calculated, it's different each time. So you get management fee which is on the amount you committed. If you do an LBO, so I put in 10 billion and you leverage up 10 times and you bought 100 billion of stuff. These fees, transaction and monitoring are based on the transaction amount. So the amount is based on the actual deal size, not my, my equity in it. So that really drives up the amount. So those two fees are a lot less in percentage, but dollar-wise it's pretty similar, and so on. And there's carry interest and there's hurdle rate and clawback for all these when you pay the performance fees. <coughs> but normal tree, so here, uh, just now I mentioned you have convertible bonds and deferred probability. This is in level one, this is in level two. So we'll look at it in a bit, but these are the calculation part. Qualitative wise, uh, depends on how fast you read. Uh, if you read uh, a pretty okay speed, it's enough time to absorb, okay? And in addition, it's uh, pretty straightforward qualitative questions. So here, uh, it's hard to do a, I'm trying to do a qualitative and a quantitative version. But qualitative is hard to do because it's hard to do with three page, three slides, qualitative without beginning and end. So here I cut out a little bit here. Um, this is in level one on CDS. Right, CDS is like health insurance, but you're insuring someone defaulting. If I'm a bond manager, I hold tons of bonds. And if I'm worried that uh, half my holdings, which is on some Chinese real estate firm, will blow up, I won't buy insurance, right? So here, because you're buying it blowing up, just like your health insurance, you can buy insurance for getting a cold and you get paid, or you can buy a severe illness, right? Otherwise, you don't get paid. So this is how they classify your illness. It's how much, how bad it gets. So these are so you can buy insurance for, let's say, if, you, uh, if I go by the level of, of um, I guess, badness, it will be, I guess, this will be the, the, the uh, I guess, number one, number two, and number three. Right, number three, it's a credit spread risk. So it's the bond price move up and down every day anyway of either the the company has issues or even other companies' events. So this is a pretty fluctuating event. Normally you don't insure that. But um, you can insure two and three depends on who you are or your view. So let's say if you are um, a pension manager and you own many investment grade bonds, your mandate or your boss say you must buy investment grade. If we find non-investment grade junk bonds in the portfolio, you're fired. <laughs> so what am I going to do? I think this firm will, will default. So I would buy the CDS on downgrade risk on investment grade to non-investment grade. Then I get my money back, I won't get fired, right? On the other hand, if I'm just a regular hedge fund guy, 
trading bonds, I may want full protection, so I might just only insure at default risk level. So downgrade risk, I, I will ignore, I don't get paid back. I only get paid back when they default and actually don't pay me. Okay, so you can buy at different level. Of course, uh, it'll be more expensive to buy one versus the other. It depends on what's being covered. So when you do the calculation, it's assuming you are fixed on one, and you ask, you call the iBank and give me a quote on CDS. They will ask you which level, how much, who it is, and they'll do the calculation. And in here, we're doing a very simple version of once they get the information, how do they calculate the chance of default? From that, they call you a price. Okay. So once they get your information, they have two different models to do. Um, I guess this is very similar to if you talk to if you have friends working at the Goldman Sachs uh, 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 research, they would have I guess two ways to value a stock a target stock price. One is using a full model. Right? So you visit him in the office, you go to his computer, he turn on an Excel worksheet with you know, three gigabytes of models or of data in it, and you, he can change one simple number for Apple iPhone 7 sales, and it'll change the share price. So it's a full-blown, full cash flow model. That is the structural model, where the, f the guy actually do the same as a research analyst for equity, but instead, his cash flow pattern is used to predict chance of default, but it's a whole shebang of stuff they do. Reduced form is like you're valuing options. You assume the market price is correct, and you back out the chance of default from that. Okay, so it's like uh, getting your implied val in options. <coughs> so that is the qualitative part. Quant part is hard to do because it's probably not enough time. So here, I'm trying to, w we have five questions that we'll do three. Many of these, once you come to class, many of these can be actually backed out by logic. Okay, even without taking the course, you can maybe at least get half of these right. Okay, so here, I'll give you a few minutes to read this first, and then we'll go through. Right, so here, this is a real estate investment. Most like the benefit from inflation. So you get three. So here, this is assuming you have an increase in inflation and it's unexpected. Okay, so of these three, which one benefits? So a lot of times it's easier to put it into like a real life situation. So I'm a, I'm a poor guy now, but in the next Mark 6, I won the only first prize of, I guess next time would be like a, a billion Hong Kong. So suddenly I'm rich. I want to invest in like Queen's Row number 9 and Queen's Row number 23. I want to buy the whole building. So I bought the building. I signed long-term agreements with the tenants. So now, of course, I borrow money to buy more. Right? So here I'm checking if suddenly inflation go up. Which one benefits me? Right? So here, if probably with a long-term lease, does it benefit me? When I sign the agreement, there'll be normally CPI adjustment, like you know MTR when they adjust the f the the, uh, the toll. But it's assume a normal rate of inflation, right? So there might be a range of increase I can have every year for the next ten years of the lease, with maybe two to ten percent increase every year. But if suddenly inflation is thirty percent, I'm stuck, right? Because now inflation is thirty percent. I max out on my rental lease agreement uh, uh, rate, maximum 10, so I'm actually losing from the uh, uh, holding a long-term lease, right? So this one cannot be benef beneficial to me. <coughs> Second one is finance with an adjustable rate mortgage. So now I borrow money to buy these properties. So it's an adjustable rate. So it's uh, being reset, let's say, every six months or a year. Inflation goes up, my the market rate goes up. So in this case, my interest payment will go up as well, right? So it won't hurt me, but it doesn't benefit me at all. 
if actually it will hurt me if my long-term leads are stuck at a lower rate, right? So this one shouldn't benefit me as well. So the last one is a fixed rate loan. So this one should benefit me, right? When I sign the agreement to borrow, it's a fixed rate 5% now, inflation 30% after two years, I'm still paying a 5%. So this one should benefit me if the inflation goes up, market rate goes up, but my loan is a fixed rate at a lower 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 rate, right? This one it's a little bit um <coughs> it's a little bit uh formula based, but I want to put it in because uh you not you don't actually need to calculate a number if you know the formula. So here this one we haven't done. <coughs> this will happen in uh in level one you have real estate and private equity. These two investment class have the price smoothed, is what it's called. Because for real estate, you don't actually get transaction all the time. Right? So you have some transaction. Many of the price estimation are appraisal, which are not actual transactions. So the price gets moved over time and you try to unsmooth it to find the actual price of the property without a natural transaction, right? So I guess nowadays it might be if, you, if you're trying to find an apartment to buy, you get an appraisal, but you know the transaction must be much different because when, it, when the price goes up and down very fast, your appraisal is lagging behind, right? So here I'm trying to unsmooth or unlag it so I can find the, what the actual price would be. Right, so here, this is the lag factor. So think of it as if I order pizza, <coughs> and let's say there there are ten slices of pizza every time I order. So point six is the amount that's left over. So I ate four, six slices are left over. That is the point six. It's checking whatever is left over or from the previous period, how much is left over. So in this case, the price is 22.32. <coughs> but this price difference, some part of it is from previous lag factor. So if I have uh, two nights, I have six slides of pizza here on the next night when I order the same pizza again and there are eight slides left, there are six from the previous day. Right? So this is the percentage of leftover from the day before. So when I check here, um, I have a $12 increase in the price and the lag factor is 0.6. So in this case, it means the actual increase in price, 0.6 comes in here. So when you look at the uh, alter alternative you have in the multiple choice, if 0.6 of the actual change is showing up as $12, the full actual change must be more than 12, right? So in this case, without calculation, A, B, and D would not be correct because the amount is too small, okay? So a lot of these, if you know the formula and how it works, um, you can pretty much eyeball or uh, exclude at least one or two of the answers. <coughs> this is the last one we'll do. Uh, this is a common asked question because it's straddled across different things. It l talks about futures and options and also on the positions of futures. So I'll let you read through this first. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
same as in trading, you might see sometimes flash crashes or whatever it is, like the market move up 10% for no reason and go back down the next five seconds later. Some, a lot of times it's someone pressing an extra zero, right? Or they should be short, but they press long. So you see these short crashes because they make an error. So a lot of the questions we have here are similar, they're trigger points. So one word can make a difference between positive and negative because you're either short or long the futures, depends on who you are. So when you read <coughs> <coughs> the question in this case, there are three things here. One is hedge. So you're not trying to make money in this case. You are the one trying to hedge the, your transaction. So uh, it changed position because in the curriculum, we are the speculators. But now this is the, the farmer trying to hedge. So this is a, the other position we have. The other is a producer. So when, we look, when you look at the curriculum, there are actually three parties for each transaction. So this is the producer. <coughs> so these are the farmers and the, uh, and, the, uh, and the miners and the oil drillers. They take things off the ground and sell it. These are the users. So let's say this is a wheat farmer. He grows wheat. He's the producer. And the user here is Kellogg. So they buy the wheat and mix cereal. And then there's a, a, the, on the end, the customer. So this is us buying conflicts from, uh, uh, from, I guess, park and shop and eat it. When you look at each one, it's actually two pairs of position which are equivalent. So the it's being sold here. So the farmer is selling the wheat. Kellogg is buying the wheat. So long and short. Once they make the, 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 uh, the cereal, then they become Kellogg becomes the seller and we become the customer. Right? So you have to make sure who they're asking. This is the producer, so they're asking for this guy, from this guy's point of view, right? So in this case, um, this is the producer, and the another, the third trigger is equity or debt. So this, let's say this is not a farmer, but a big agricultural firm. So he has issued equity and debt, and you bought the debt of this company and you want to hatch against the debt being uh, uh, I guess being defaulted so here I guess you can buy a CDS of the easiest thing to do right but it's similar so here before we actually do anything um, if you've done accounting I didn't know accounting was so useful before but sometimes I realize if you heard of hatch accounting so uh, many firms blow up many years ago because they were using hedging uh, or the so-called hedging to speculate. So after that, many accounting rules are set in, uh, forcing ways to record hedging to make it more strict so people cannot fool around and speculate using company's money. So when you're hedging, you can never short an option. Except for one, except for one scenario, so this is except for a caller. So in this case, when you buy an option, it gives you the right to exercise, so you can protect with that right. When you short an option, you sold the right. It's just like a, I guess, uh, uh, I guess it's just like a man in a marriage. You lost all rights to anything. There's no protection whatsoever. So in this case. Um, Short an option is never a proper hedge. So when you look down the list, a sell call option, this one cannot be a proper hedge unless it's a caller. So A is already out, cannot be happening. The other is you, you have to buy an option. So B and C is still in the running. You can also sell or buy futures, right? So now we'll still have B, C, and D. So here, <coughs> when we look at this guy we're trying to hedge. So whenever you have hedging or risk management, you figure out what will kill him, what makes him cry at night. 
So for him, when you look at the money he received, so he has revenue and cost and then profit, right? Wheat price is his revenue. So when the wheat price go down, that is his risk, right? Because wheat price is how much he sell it for. For him, if the wheat price crash and tanked, he'll have much lower revenue, but his expense will be the same, right? Because he spent the money to grow the wheat, it's really fixed. So his profit will crash, his cash flow will crash, your bonds get defaulted. So that's what I'm trying to protect, right? So here, what I need is I need to buy or sell something so that I make money when the wheat price crash. So if wheat price crash, he's in trouble, his bond get defaulted, but my hedging makes money, so that offsets it. So when I look through the list, what will make me money when wheat price, whatever the, the commodity price crash? So if I buy a put, this will give me money or profit to hedge against the wheat price crashing. That's a okay protection. For the call, call is to have the upside potential, right? Because call is when price go, you make money. In this case, it probably won't apply here. The other is futures. So if I sell futures, you also make money when the price tank, right? So in this case, these both will work. But which one now? So here, uh, before we look at a default probability, CDS, for bonds, it's a pretty strange, it's this way, right? When the firm is doing well, the bonds still only get a fixed return on your coupons. When the company crash, then you got the downside. So it's not a linear relationship. If you sell futures, what happens? When you short the futures, your return profile looks like this, right? This is wheat price. Wheat price go down, you make money, so it offsets against this crash. But when the wheat price go up in money, you lose money here. So if you sell futures, crash comes, you're okay. But if the crash don't come, and the wheat price actually go up, you actually start losing money on your hedge. So it's not a perfect hatch for selling futures. It only works in the crash. When there's no crash, it actually hurts you. So option is only one that will work this way, okay? If the question asks is commodity user, then what will be the proper answer in this case? If, if the question asks for this guy here, so how do you hash a commodity user's debt? then it's Kellogg's debt. So it's the same rationale for Kellogg, wheat price, it's the cost now, right? Because for Kellogg, the revenue comes from the customer at the supermarket, right? $100 per box. But the wheat price is Kellogg's cost. So for them, um, the if the wheat price go up, it will kill Kellogg. Because the cost go up, no profit, no cash flow, they default it. So when you ask how to protect a risk of commodity users debt defaulting, B would be the correct answer, right? Because B is call on the wheat price. Wheat price go up, you make money on the call hedge, even though Kellogg went down, right? So depends on who they asked, or the probably a lot of the answers here is correct. Depends on who it is. There's two more questions here. But this one takes whatever is in a note to answer. So you can check, call Janet, she'll charge you a little bit of money to give you the answer. Uh, but you can look at it and see what the notes will involve.